Okay. Yes. Um, so this is my talk, um, Poetry and Creative Writing for the Web. Um, no, not really. Um, but we will talk about languages. Um, so to start this off, I'm just going to give you the most important piece of information at the start, and then we'll elaborate on that. Um, but at least, like, if you take anything home, let it be this. Um, and I'll, I'll bring it as poetically as I can, because I wrote it in a haiku. Um, so, for formal language, avoid plain strings at all cost. Use data structures. Right. Um, this talk is kind of in three parts. I'm going to first explain what I mean by this, then why I say this, and then how you could achieve this. And it'll sort of go from very generic theoretical to more practical. Um, and it's a, gener it's, a, it's a general principle, but towards the end we're going to sort of see how this specifically applies to HTML. Right, so language. Um, these are the languages that I can kind of have a conversation in, um, to varying degrees. Um, you can try my French, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> so, language is a way to communicate, right? Um, so it's basically like what language does is get an idea out of my head into your head. Um, and suppose that I have this sudden notion of a platypus carrying a chicken in the forest. And I want to convey this to you. I want you to notice that a platypus is carrying a chicken in the forest. So before I can say these words, um, I have to figure out the, the components of this thought and how they relate to each other. And then I can sort of dive into my mental dictionary of whichever language I'm hoping to speak, um, pull out the individual words, um, but that's not enough, because then maybe I would end up with forest carry platypus chicken. Doesn't really convey the same thing. Um, so also how they relate to each other. And that's kind of where grammar comes in. Um, so in my mind, somewhere there's this intermediate representation where I kind of have these words and sort of how I think they sort of fit into um, a composed idea. Um, and now I can... The, the problem with this is, you know, ideally I could just sort of transport, transport this straight into your mind, so now you have this same structured idea, but language is linear, I can only say one word, one sound at a time, so I have to use grammar to use, you know, little extra words here and there, maybe change the ending of a word here and there, to have a linear sentence but still convey that whole structure. And then I can speak that, um, you pick out the individual words, you reconstruct this. If we speak the same language, if we're both equally fluent, then we should arrive for the same sentence at exactly the same representation. And then from there, you know, we each sort of have our idea of what that means exactly. Like maybe a platypus for me looks slightly different than it does for you. But at least like up to this point, we should have complete agreement. And that is the magic of language, that you reconstruct this tree in your mind and that now we share this identical representation, um, even though we each sort of derive our own meaning from that. Right, now that's natural language. Um, to study natural language, uh, people have been coming up since the 60s, 70s uh, with formal languages, so sort of restricting language to a very narrow subset with very rigid rules so they could more easily reason about this. And this has been great for computer science because basically all our programming languages and, and a lot of theoretical stuff about computation, about complexity, sort of goes back to this model of formal language. And um, in formal language theory, a formal language is defined as a set of strings of symbols governed by strict rules. Um, symbols would be your alphabet or your character set. Um, set of strings, for instance, in the case of Ruby, the set of strings of the Ruby language is all well-formed Ruby programs. 
So that's sort of the set definition of a language. Um, strict rules are what is captured in a grammar, and in particular in formal languages, um, they call that a formative grammar because it specifies how you generate uh, strings. So here's a, a simple example. I'm using this uh, BNF notation, which you see in, in uh, RFCs as well. This is uh, a little grammar I wrote up for all uh, mathematical equations over natural numbers uh, with only uh, addition and multiplication. So basically, we can start from this symbol and expand and expand and expand until we only have symbols left out of our alphabet and then we have something that's part of our language. So for, I know for a lot of you this is basics, but sort of want to make this talk as self-contained as possible. Um, so using this grammar, we can look at some expressions and say that, okay, the ones at the top are well-formed. You can arrive at these using these rules. The ones at the bottom are not because a sum requires an expression on the left-hand side, and this one doesn't. Minus is not even part of our language, so this language cannot express this uh, equation, and the one at the bottom is not an equation at all. Um, and so, when you do this, when you use these rules to generate a statement or a, a string of your language, you can sort of represent that in a similar way, like we started at equation, expanded, expanded, expanded. You again arrive at this syntax tree. Now the interesting thing to note here is that even though this is just a formal, like it, it's only really concerned with how it's structured, not necessarily with its meaning, but the meaning pretty much always um, corresponds with the syntax tree. So if we would evaluate this, we would basically do the same thing backwards, sort of replace this whole subtree with the actual computed sum, do the same thing here, and then evaluate the thing at the top. So even though formal languages differ and their meanings differ, um, there's always sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between their interpretation and the syntax tree. And language is everywhere. So there's not just the programming languages, there's markup languages like HTML, there's data languages like JSON, um, network protocols. Even when they are binary, they can be usually expressed as uh, some kind of formal language. Um, even something like your call stack is in a way a language. Um, and actually a typical Rails or Ruby web project will use uh, pretty much all of these, maybe not exactly all, like you might not be using CoffeeScript or whatever, but the majority of the, the languages on this page will be involved at some point. So there's like, there's a lot of language going around that we really take for granted that we don't think about that much. And for each of these, um, well, either you're writing your application in that language, but for the rest, you're either consuming that generate that language or you're generating that language, like you're consuming a JSON request, or um, you're generating some HTTP, uh, some HTML. And so what I'm saying, and what I hope to convince you of, is that in each case, you should internally be using syntax trees. You should be using structured representations. Right. So that was sort of the what part. Uh, of course, like why, you know, um, we're happy the way we're doing things. Um, why should we reconsider? Um, well, here's one good reason. So cross-site scripting is um, probably the most common vulnerability uh, for web uh, applications. Uh, what it means is, so if you have, for instance, a blog application, uh, you let a user write a post, a post had a body, and so in some helper, you're sort of, you know, you're wrapping that in a div, and then at the end, it's ending up on a template on a page. Um, and if you just do it like this, then that user can put anything in there, and it'll end up on the page, um, including, but not limited to, JavaScript. So, for instance, here I'm just sort of having the login form post to my server, which captures the user data. Um, but the typical use case of this, of course, is session hijacking, where they um, steal the session cookie uh, 
of the user, and now the attacker can use your site with whatever credentials it stole. Um, now, in Rails, um, and of in general in web programming, like you know, cross-site scripting has been around since the beginning of the web, um, and we know we should know that we need to escape our inputs. That's sort of the general knowledge that, okay, you know, then you just escape HTML. So it replaces certain characters with HTML entities, you know, um, so that the browser will, in will interpret this as just plain text and no longer as a script tag or a... It's also, it's not, it's not just limited to script tags. Like, you can do cross-site scripting in many, many... Um, creative ways, like it's not just about keeping the script tags out, but that's a convenient example. Um, but still, cross-site scripting is a more common vulnerability than buffer overflows. So uh, buffer overflows have always been sort of the, you know, if you're doing C programming, systems programming, sort of the main security thing that everybody needs to watch out for, but actually you know, cross-site scripting has become a much more common vulnerability. Um, and just this winter, uh, we've had a lot of fun with security issues. Um, and one of the last ones to fall out um, was a vulnerability in the Sanitize Helper. So that's a helper in Ruby on Rails that sort of tries to strip all of the evil stuff out of your inputs that you're putting into your page again, while still maintaining some HTML that is considered safe. Um, and so this version of this method that have, has been used for years in countless production apps um, suddenly was discovered was not actually safe at all. If you crafted your input in the right way, you could bypass it. And so all Rails apps were vulnerable. Um, so why is it so hard? Like we all know we need to watch out for this and still it's happening all the time. Um, well, here's uh, a symptom. So this is an actual shipping label. Some of you might have seen this pass by on Twitter or whatever um, social network site you're on. Um, this is a UPS shipping label. And so here is supposed to be a name, but there's just a lot of garbage. Um, how you can reproduce this is you start with a O with a diacritic with an accent mark on it. Then you misinterpret this, you know, it's actually UTF-8, but you sort of think that it's Latin 1, um, and then reinterpret it. Um, then you end up with these two, like a uh, capital A with a tilde on top and a uh, so, uh, super 3. Um, you replace those with HTML entities, um, which is basically already a first kind of HTML escaping, and then you do it two times more. Um, and that's why you get like amp, amp. Sure, like you've seen things like this before. And why is this a great symptom? Because how do we get at this? This is what you get when every subsystem, every library, every programmer is like, escape, escape all the things, escape everything, escape all the time, escape more. Um, so really, we might want to consider becoming more systematic about it. Um, and in a way, Rails has. So Rails 3 ships with HTML save buffer, which is used by default in ERB templates, I think also in Haml templates. Um, what this does, um, now if you insert something in the, in the template, in the background, instead of appending it just to a normal string buffer, it's going to append this to this magic buffer that escapes anything you add to it. Um, Except some methods do return HTML, like you have your helpers which do return snippets of HTML. So then you need to flag them as HTML safe. So this is all cool, but when you think about it, it's just the inverse of the same thing. Like before we were saying this and that is not safe, now we're saying this and that is safe. Um, this is a step up, so in security, whitelisting, stating explicitly what is good and um, rather than trying to blacklist, like these things are not good, is much preferred 
Um, if you blacklist, you can never expect to be complete. Um, so it's good, but we're still leaving it to the programmer to mark the right thing, which is still likely um, going to cause us to slip up at some point. And so the real issue um, is that when we have a string on our application, we really don't know what it represents. Is it really just a string, or is it a piece of an HTML DOM tree? Um, so this is the ideal situation where, you know, here's your user input, and by the time it gets to the other side, it's exactly the same thing. Like, we, we speak the same language and we understand each other. Um, in the case of cross-site scripting, this is what happens. So what was this nice green little snippet of text that you thought you were putting into your tree, you are now, like, on the other side, suddenly it turns out is actually God knows what. And actually, in the case of um, typical Ruby or Rails web application, what's happening is more like this. Like, we have no, no component that knows how to serialize HTML. We just do it all over the place. This is like a tangle of templates and helpers and uh, cells and decorators and presenters and wrapper objects and God knows what. Um, and the thing is that if you kind of, so HTML is just another language. If you look at another language that your app generates, which is H SQL, then you'll realize that we are actually doing this for SQL because injection attacks also happen in SQL, have been around longer than the web. Um, and it seems in this case, people are a bit smarter about it. So when you have this innocent um, active record query, what you'll get back is an active record relation, which is backed by Errol, a relational algebra, um, which actually has a string representation, uh, a, a tree representation of that query. So you can chain on it and sort of rewrite or add stuff to this tree. But the important part is that here, like this query, this string, it's a, it's a leaf node, and active record, by the time it goes to the database, knows how to generate correct HTML so that this will always still be interpreted as still a string. Whereas, yeah, for strings, we're basically just adding a flag. So, yeah, this one's safe, yeah, done. Um, and HTML might seem simple, you know, like it's just HTML, just some tags, like, you know, why not just use ERB templates? Well, HTML is actually a very tricky thing um, because language we've defined as being a set of strings, but when was the last time your browser told you, oh, sorry, like, I'm not rendering this page because it's not valid, I don't understand it? That doesn't happen. Why? Because browsers accept everything. Um, so basically, the language of HTML as it is understood in the wild is the language of all strings. Like, everything's HTML. How do we get here? Because of Postel's principle. This was a guy who was around in the early days when the internet was just evolving out of the ARPANET, and he coined this principle, be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. And this has been great. This has definitely um, helped us sort of get to the point where we are now, which just made systems work, you know, they were figuring this stuff out. Um, but it's also gotten us, us into this whole mess. Um, so be conservative in what you send, great. Definitely what I'm saying as well. But be liberal in what you accept. Um, this has caused HTML parsers to basically be rewriting engines. So they don't really fit any of the categories of parsers or of languages that you typically encounter. Um, they're just a beast of its own, and the, the parsing phase, um, f like a later processing phase, feeds back into the parsing phase to insert closing tags, and like if it reaches the end of the document and it hasn't found the closing title tag, then it's going to go like reparse that page again with different assumptions. Like who knows what they're doing? 
Um, and this is why like, I, I have a link in the references with um, all ways that you can do cross-site scripting injections. Just, and it's basically like all different strings that you just copy-paste into some field and sort of see what happens. And it's amazing the kind of stuff that works, just because it, like, it trips up browsers. Um, so that's, that's kind of why, you know, like if we, if we have a dedicated component that knows how to generate that language and does it correctly, only then can we hope that what we, are, what we think we are transmitting is understood the same way on the other side. Um, but why else? Um, in case that security, like, which should be enough justification, but in case you want more justification, you're, you're programming at a higher level of abstraction, like chunking together strings. Sure, Ruby is great at string processing, but um, if you go for a higher level of abstraction, your code can be more expressive and you can be more productive and you can do more interesting stuff with that. Okay, so that was the what and the, how and the why part. Now how? Um, so especially for HTML, I'm sure it's clear that we're kind of far away from that ideal. Um, so what would we want? Well, we would want a data type that can sort of concisely represent um, an HTML tree that's easy to work with. We need good parsers and generators, and ideally these would be just automatically generated from the same grammar. Um, there are some projects going on that do those kind of things. Um, and uh, there will have to evolve some, some tools, some APIs to make this uh, more interesting and, and easy to work with for application developers. Like you have your high level needs um, and those are often same kind of category across application. So we, we could have libraries that do all kinds of interesting stuff with these data structures. Um, and what you end up at is what I call the apples and snakes architecture. So I have this um, scientific diagram of what I mean by this. Kind of looks like this. So the snakes are your strings, and you want to keep those out of your app. And at the border, you have this smart wizard who knows exactly how to turn a snake into apples or vice versa. And inside your app, there are no dangerous snakes. They're just tasty apples. So keep the snakes out of the app. Um, but like I said, we need, we need data types, and we need a way to construct them. And ideally, it would kind of almost feel like you're just um, constructing native types. Like just, it's just a literal notation of, um, of, of a DOM tree, basically. Uh, and it should be composable so that one part of your code can generate like subtrees. So you could have, like, for instance, a, a UI widget uh, and sort of compose that into bigger trees. And then all the way at the end, it gets serialized. Um, and it should be easy to reason about, so you can actually, you know, when you're programming, you don't hurt your brain, and you can actually do all this stuff and get your job done. Um, so what do we have? We have an Okogiri, um, which has the object approach. So each thing is an object, and you make a new object and sort of tie them together. Um, Nokogiri is what I tried first, and it works, um, but. It's kind of tedious. For instance, like you need a, a reference to your document just to construct a note. So even if there's just some helper method or some helper class constructing a, a UI widget, it would still kind of know, need to know what document it is being inserted in. And the only reason I found sort of trying to figure out this code and reading some comments that this has to do with garbage collection um, and I think it, it shows that Nokogiri is very much geared towards parsing and not towards, towards generating. But it uses libxml under the hood, um, which at least gives you a solid implementation. The drawback of that is that libxml2 only really knows about HTML4, so hopefully they'll, they'll support HTML5 in the future. But it's correct, and you have your composable objects. Um, the other thing is the builder syntax. There's a number of libraries that offer a builder syntax. Um, a lot of these generate uh, HTML straight off, so that's not what you want. You want some underlying data type that you kind of 
know how to deal with. Um, but but as as far as the syntax goes, like um, it's a matter of taste, but it it could certainly work. Um, the only thing I found sometimes irritating with builders, like you have a, a version with a block parameter and one without a block parameter, and it can be hard to keep track of what what is self-referring to, you know, because you're actually you're specifying data, but they're actually all just method calls. So, like if you want to do a paragraph, then you have to make sure that it doesn't clash with the p method out of Ruby, stuff like that. But for the rest, it it totally works. Um, there's templating, like maybe I. Um, and I, I added this slide later after some, some discussion about this. Um, so ERB template def definitely is not going to work because you're mixing two, two um, responsibilities, uh, both like expressing your, your semantics, your, what you want to do, and your serialized um, HTML. But something like Haml could work. Haml at the moment compiles to Ruby, which uses just append stuff to buffers. So it doesn't do that at the moment, but you could totally reuse the syntax and re-implement that. Um, but you would have to disallow inserting, inserting HTML strings. So if you have a helper, if you have something that generates some HTML, it would have to generate a object, a tree, that you insert into your bigger tree. Um, and finally, um, from the Lisp world, we get as expressions, which is basically you know a fancy way of saying put stuff into lists, um, which some people like it, some people hate it. Again, it's a matter of taste. Um, I like this a lot because it's like it's what you see is what you get. Um, and so now you can actually program your HTML. You can just like. Um, Say I have an object which is my sign-up page, and I have an object which is my layout, and I put one inside the other, and I have this uh, this this component that contains the logic of um, when I have some parameters uh, from a form coming in that I want to repopulate that form with the same same parameters, you know. And there's actually a project um, also I think it's called Lufa, maybe that's another one. Um, Anyway, I'll link to it in the references, which does this, and it does that by using Nokogiri to parse again what you're outputting and then inserting it and then generating it again. You know? So like people are already trying to do these kind of things, and they have to jump through hoops and like convert back and forth. Um, so there is obviously still a gap in our tooling. Um, and I'm not saying I have all the answers, but um, I have been working on a little project that tries to bridge some of the gap, um, which is called HEXP, um, which stands for HTML expressions, because it's basically as expressions for, um, for HTML. So I'm just going to briefly kind of show what that looks like to give you a feel for it. Um, so I'm kind of hijacking the global H, if you have that defined in your app, then too bad. Um, and then you, um, so you do something like that, and that's, that's a node, um, which has a tag, you know, so that's, that's a paragraph or a, or a div, um, could have attributes. And it could have children which is now empty. But so here you could put, you know, an array of whatever you want to put in there or just a single node. Um, or just a string, in which case it's just going to turn into a text node. And so by the time it gets serialized, it'll be escaped. Um, and so under the hood, this uses Nokogiri um, so you you can say to DOM and then you get a Nokogiri DOM or to HTML and then it converts it to HTML. Um, and if your object implements the method to hexp, which is kind of a standard protocol for this, then you know you can say like you know my widget dot new uh, here, and it'll convert that and sort of put that into your whole whole tree. Um, so that's kind of you know, this still needs a lot more sugar, um, but this is kind of the basic idea. Um, 
So here's an ex uh, a Sinatra app that kind of uses this. So yeah, this is just, you know, so I have some in-memory storage. Um, it's a to-do list app, so there's an entry on your to-do list which has a description. Um, I'm inheriting from widget here, which has some magic in the background to turn this into a, a hexp. Um, and all I need to specify is the contents. Um, then I have a list of entries. So again, like, you know, it's, I'm just mapping and, and like, you know, using all your Ruby list manipulation, basically, rather than string manipulation. Um, here's the form to add new stuff. Here's my layout. Um, notice that the head here is empty. Um, and here's my final page. Um, so it'll sort of take the layout, put two things in there, my list of entries and the form. Uh, it'll add the title. So this is a method which uses the rewrite method of Hexp to take the, the note that is a head and sort of rewrite it into a new note with an extra child, which is the title. And similarly, I'm like my my entry, my my to-do list entry, just generates uh, a, a list item. So I'm wrapping that into a form, um, so I can remove it again. You know, and then just a couple Sinatra app, uh, Sinatra actions to uh, to tie that together. So this is what it looks like. Now, a cool thing with this is that uh, my widget class, I haven't shown you the implementation, but it does a couple things. Uh, for instance, it'll use the class name to give this a class. So if you have you know, some UI widget, then they all have the same HTML class. Um, if it has an ID, the ID, then it will add a, a data ID attribute. Um, and also, um, so here the last one just calls this class method handlebars. So that's also something that that widget, which is just an example, like it's in the examples directory of Hexp. Um, but so that basically takes your definition of your widget and turns it uh, handlebars, turns it into a handlebars template that you can use in your JavaScript or whatever. So you have like a single definition of your node. Um, so that's that's all I'm gonna say about Hexp, um, you know, because I'm, I'm not here to sort of sell you guys on this, just trying to say, okay, like we we have a gap in our tooling um, and it's kind of the other way around, like I think we need to do it better and so I've been working on this and if you're interested, like have a look at what's there already. Um, so in summary, don't serialize by hand, don't reinvent the wheel badly, Mixing serialization with your business logic violates the single responsibility principle, so let someone else do the serializing for you. Program high level, so you're, you, know, you care about semantics, so closest representation you get is the syntax tree, and you gain expressive power. Data structures are programmable, they make your code more powerful, more expressive, oh, and by the way, they might help solve injection attacks. So snakes and apples, or you'll make the wizard cry. Let's have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ani. Uh, so we don't have that much time for question. Um, one or two questions, maybe. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so what I understand is you still have to escape uh, whenever you you insert a string. You still have to escape it for somehow, even if you are building a syn syntax tree on top of it. So yeah. you, you keep the logic to, to escape a, any string coming from any client. Code. Yeah, so yeah. your strings still get escaped. Um, the point is that escaping is a language property. And so your app shouldn't care about the escaping. It just passes strings on to the part that generates the HTML. 
and that part knows that, oh, it's a string, so in HTML I need to represent it in a certain way so it's still a string. So that's the point where it sort of gets serialized, but it's really something that as it goes out, it serializes, and as it's interpreted, it, uh, it, it escapes, and as it gets interpreted, like that gets, gets interpreted, it's sort of in the middle there, and you no longer really think about it. Um, how, do, how do you get um, other, other people who don't uh, know um, coding to work with you? Because um, HTML and uh, when, when you work with designers, uh, sometimes they, they even don't understand CSS. But when you have designer understanding CSS, how do you get them to understand what you are doing with um, the, wo the whole uh, things you are developing? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, so one thing you could do is have your designers uh, just work in HTML and sort of convert that automatically. Um, like, but basically, uh, I think it, it works best when you have a very UI-driven design, where you sort of have separate UI components that get designed um, and that you can then turn into methods and classes, but sort of you can automate that conversion in some ways. So I've been actually um, thinking about linking this um, with another idea of style guide driven development. So what I would really like to see is for people to have basically a separate repository which contains the front end of their app, like not even the front end, but the UI components of their app with all the CSS. And so you sort of you render all of that on one page. So you have all your all your components that you have would have on any page. And that's what your designer works with, like to, to style that. You just have like one huge HTML page to style all that stuff. But the code that generates that uses the same widgets that you use in your app. So like you just then gem require your, your UI gem or you are your UI Git repo and, and that's it. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Sorry for going over time. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks.